What is going on, everyone? Welcome back. STL Tones here. We are back with our podcast, Abel Hernandez here, and I am joined by producer, mixer, and engineer, Zach Cervini. Zach, what's going on, man? Thank you for joining us. What's up, Abel? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? Uh, everything's doing great, man. We have great weather out here in Southern California, which uh, we were just talking off camera. And you said you are in LA, right? Yes, I am in North Hollywood, California. I'm in my little apartment where I've kind of been mixing and producing over the last couple months. Um, yeah, yeah, I have a studio down the street, like a mile or so away, and um, it's like a super awesome spot. But over the past couple months through this quarantine and everything, I've kind of been, I got a new laptop and I kind of been producing and mixing from home. And it's honestly, has been awesome to be able to work on my own time and to be here like at home all the time has been really cool. Right, right. That was actually going to be my first question. That was a perfect yeah. way to kind of lead into that is what, what <laughs> has been like the most, obviously, you know, producing and, and making music and stuff is probably the most creative outlet. But what specifically, like, have you been working on other people's music? Have you just been creating your own? What's been keeping you busy these past few months? Yes. Yeah, so, so when it started, I love to mix and eventually, hopefully in the future, I'll kind of be like a full-time mixer. That's one of my goals, but I love to mix and I've gotten a ton of well, first of all, I mix I, I mix a lot of live stuff. Um, usually like a lot of bands that I work with when they do live performances and stuff, they'll just be like, hey, could you throw a quick mix on this if they're doing Jimmy Kimmel or whatever, a show like that, or just like at their own live stream or something. So I do a lot of that stuff. And then um, obviously I mix a ton of records as well. So I've been, yeah, I've been working on a bunch of that here at home and I've done a couple, I've produced a few songs via FaceTime and whatnot and stuff which has been cool, but it's not really for me. I kind of miss like the in-person connection of being in the studio a lot. But as of late, we I have been going to the studio and doing some sessions as well. And everyone's been masked up and gloved up and washing their hands and everything and stuff. And yeah, yeah. I like wash wash the mic every session and everything. But yeah, yeah that, new, that new dystopian, uh, yes, dystopian yes. way of mixing music, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Totally. Um, kind of leading me into the into the next question. Of course, like you said, you're producing a ton of music, but obviously your your genre list of of you know the range of what you produce is vastly um, just huge, right? Like most people, if you have a metal producer and mixer, he's a metal guy. If you have yes. somebody who does pop, he does pop. You seem to kind of walk between those lines and do all of it. How, what's your approach <laughs> to that? And is it different for every type of genre of music? Yes, yeah, so. It's crazy. So growing up, you know, Rick Rubin was always someone that I looked up to and aspired to be just he could produce from the Red Hot Chili Peppers to the Dixie Chicks to Slayer to all kinds of different genres. And yeah, I always thought that was really cool. And growing up, I just found a love for, you know, like like a lot of people, I discovered Metallica one day and then just went to the metal world. And I exclusively worked on and listened to death metal for many, many years as a teenager. And then as time went on, my musical taste just kind of expanded. And so, you know, it's funny when I was when I was a kid, when I was like 18, 19, I was producing bands like Lorna Shore. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're like a like a super heavy black death metal band. And yeah, definitely. Um, and then um, nowadays I'm like I'm working on stuff with, you know, BB Rexa right now, <laughs> which is. Um, yeah. So it's, so it's kind of funny to do um, to go but to go from like super heavy death metal to like straight top 40 pop which is pretty cool um but it's it's crazy because i started producing in my parents basement and every song i do kind of feels still like that to me it kind of feels the same and i kind of approach everything i do the same still it doesn't really feel any different no matter how big or small or what the genre of the band is it kind of always feels like its own thing to me that's uh that's that's crazy to think about because if you think of a name like bb rexa versus a name like you know you know, a death metal band or something like that, where, where yeah. I mean, obviously not judging or critiquing the music in any form, but one of them is obviously much more mainstream than the other and much more popular and carries a lot more ears and yeah. people along with it. So yeah, like, what's the, like when you get into the studio with, with a big name, you know, what's yeah. the difference in approaching it? Like, do you deal with them differently? Are you just a little more tentative with your thoughts and ideas or how's that work? Yeah. So, I mean, every project that I do, I will do a lot of research beforehand. If I know that I'm getting into the studio with a certain kind of band, I'll try to have conversations with the band ahead of time and FaceTime and text and be like, what are you listening to? What do you love? And then another big part of it is when bands call me, I'll be like, why are you coming to me? Is it, a, is there a certain thing that I've done that you've liked? 
or is there a certain thing that you think I can help you with? Um, and it's my kind of style is I, I work a lot in the alternative music space. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not quite, it's interesting because whenever I'm in like a pop room, I'm like the rock guy, but whenever right. I'm in like a rock room, I'm like the pop guy. So <laughs> I kind of, I kind of, you know, ride this, ride this interesting line. And, um, I am a fan of when I work with, like a rock or a metal band, I'm a fan of bringing out, you know, the melodies and maybe mixing the vocals a little bit louder than they would um, in general and kind of kind of pushing it more in the like alternative pop direction just because that's what I naturally do and what I like. And when I work with a more pop group, it kind of goes the opposite way and I kind of tend to edge it up a little bit and, and and bring it more into the you know the edgy alternative space um, that maybe they're not used to, and so that's yeah that's kind of every every genre and every artist that I work with when I go into the project, it's yeah it's kind of I'm kind of always pulling it towards that direction instinctually. That's just kind of what I do. Right, right. Have you ever have you ever been uh, like surprised by let's say if you're working with Five Seconds of Summer, have you ever been surprised by their influences? Like maybe somebody likes a really hardcore band or something like that. Has that ever happened? Oh yeah, yeah. Five Seconds of Summer. Yeah, those kids. I've known them for a long time, and yeah, when they came to, they're from Australia, and so I remember when they came to the states for the first time. It was in like 2011 or 2012 when we started working, and they were listening to like rise against and parkway drive and like we came as romans and like all these like all these heavy bands and stuff and it was it was so funny to it, it was like that was a really cool and inspiring thing for me to see the space that they were in and the space that they were occupying and how how huge their platform is and like seeing that they loved a lot of the same music that i loved that um and i i think they really helped um I think they really helped a lot of that music reach more people, which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's really like kind of a, almost a bridge type of uh, genre yeah. that they're in because they're still playing instruments. They're still doing that stuff. You know, they're on the lighter side, obviously, but I think that's a pretty cool gap to get other people who may not be searching for that style of music kind of walk over that bridge and yeah, know, that kind of harder, you know. Yeah, rock. yeah, totally. I, I love that. And I obviously, you know, rock music and harder music is kind of is what i love and what i like and so and it's not the biggest thing in the world right now so so finding ways to help that reach more people is that always excites me like i always think that's really cool yeah definitely um so if you were going to play i mean I'm, I'm assuming it's guitar but if you were going to just pick up an instrument you're going to play kind of on your own time do your yes. own music therapy what instrument are you playing yeah, guitar is my instrument. Guitar was my first. I started playing guitar when I was in fourth grade. And I went through this crazy phase in like middle school and high school where I went through like a crazy jazz phase. And I was listening to exclusively jazz music and taking jazz guitar lessons and playing in jazz combos and stuff. And right. it's it's weird. I kind of have lost all that stuff now. <laughs> but um, but yeah, there there was a long time where I was I was really into I had my real book and I was I was super into just playing jazz music and playing jazz standards all the time. So yeah, guitar is my instrument that I play and I'm I'm by no means like a guitar player but the, like I play the computer is my real instrument is what I play but gotcha. um, but yeah but I got I got started playing guitar um and then I'm not a drummer but I love drums so much drums are something that I'm like definitely I'm obsessed with and I'm obsessed with finding new drum sounds and tones and stuff over the years that's what I really love too I feel like cuz I love drums too and yeah I mean, all of us, I feel like no matter what instrument you play, whether you're a bass player, you could be a saxophone player, I think. And you, whenever your drummer walks away from the kit, you're just kind of like sneaking over there. Like you want to go and play. It's so many guitar players, so many musicians that I know, they're just like, yeah, I play this and I play it and I'm good at it. And this is how I make my living. This is what I do. So yeah. I love playing drums. You know, everybody just across the board loves drums. Me included. I used to play drums for a long time. I loved it. I, can't, I, mean, I don't think I was any good at it, but yeah. And also like, like I'm a, I grew up as a, I, I wish that I could, even though you don't play jazz anymore, I wish that I could at least say I had some sort of background in that type of music because <laughs> I grew up a guitar meathead, you know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Like metal core. And when I was young, I remember getting, um, I don't remember the name of the magazine, but I was seeing like, like Mick from Slipknot on it. You yeah. Know? You know, it's just like totally. Metallica, all that stuff. So I never 
paused for a second to get into like theory and jazz and kind of expand yeah. on that idea. So that's pretty cool that you have that background. I'm sure it helps with uh, when you're producing and being able to hear different sounds, you know, mentally probably. Not yeah. Like, you know, being yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's like so I, I work with a lot of people that are crazy talented musicians like music theory freaks and stuff who are getting all crazy with harmonies and seventh chords and the whole thing. And so, yeah, my jazz background lets me allows me to be able to keep up with that a little bit, which is nice. <laughs> a completely different language, man. I've been in the room and just kind of <laughs> just making music and like here with somebody just for fun. You know what I mean? And they start talking yeah. about, you know, major chords and minor chords. And granted, those are very basic things about theory. And I'm just yeah. like, <laughs> I mean, that, this is all I really know. Yeah, it's it's interesting though. Like, I think there's something to be said for that too, because sometimes I feel like your knowledge of music can hurt you because yeah. it can it can take away like the most pure form of why you love the way something sounds. Like, like certain people, if they know enough about music and they're playing a guitar part, it, it might sound cool to someone, and it might emotionally affect someone, but they may not like it because it's technically not correct right. so um so yeah that's that's a tricky line um to always ride as well like yeah a lot of the yeah seeing how much like wrong music you can get away with that sounds good a lot of the yeah. time yes yeah sometimes i wish i knew i mean i don't i don't i don't know like a ton about music theory and stuff but but sometimes i think it'd be interesting like what if i knew nothing about it like what would happen because i know so many amazing musicians and so many amazing people that like have never taken a lesson in their life and don't know the notes on the fretboard and that can upstage anyone and it's it's pretty sick right right um just to kind of put this in here now to make sure i don't glaze over it's a little bit of a shameless plug for us but yes. you just recently released your tone hub preset pack and that along with a kemper pack um yes. just really quickly kind of run us through how you put together that list i mean obviously i'm sure you are able to come up with a vastly different amount of sound so Mm -hmm. What you know? What helped you? <coughs> oh, sorry, how did you narrow that down to that list? So that, um, so I, yeah, I've been building up guitar sounds. I've been producing. I'm 27 now, and I've been I've been producing since I was. I've been interested in it since I was like 14 or 15, since when I was a kid. Um, so obviously, I've gone down so many different wormholes and been so obsessed with so many different things. One of which being guitar tone. And so every project I work on. I have, I, I'm super perfectionist and I obsess over every single little thing, including the guitar sound. So uh, a lot of these guitar tones are tones that I've spent literally weeks or months on just shooting things out and just trying different tones. And then at the end of every project, I kind of have these certain tones that I use for different things. Like I might have, you know, a clean tone I use for clean parts, a distorted tone I use for distorted parts and other weird tones and heavy tones to layer in and things like that. And I've just, all the different genres and all the different bands that I've produced over the years, I've amassed this kind of arsenal of different versatile guitar sounds that I've really spent a lot of time on. And so it's kind of cool to have them. Some of these guitar tones are 10, you know, from records I did 10 years ago that are in this pack and it's really cool to be able to have this full list of everything that i can just pull up um instantaneously that i've made over so many years right right and uh obviously along with the guitar tones you have bass tones going with the shoe pack mm -hmm. as well so what's the thought process with those is that just are you just trying to mix it as well as possible are you a fan of good gritty bass tone? like how, how do you approach that yeah bass tone is super super important to me and it's a really interesting bass tone is a really interesting thing to me because it's hard to get a bass tone to be just right because you need to have so many people want to hear like a dirty bass tone but when you distort the bass too much the low end kind of goes away so it's kind of a tricky line to ride between having a bass tone that's gritty enough and that has enough of an interesting tone but while not being over the top and that's something I still haven't perfected and something that I'm always struggling with. But yeah, I, I love just being able to plug a bass in and to just scroll through some nice bass tones and get a great bass sound. Like that's like so important, like low end in music is like sonically, in my opinion, is the most important thing to having like a good sounding song. So yeah, that's why bass tones are super important to me. Right. 
Awesome. If you guys, by the way, if you guys are watching, listening to this podcast right now, uh, he uh, Zach does have available packs for the Tone Hub and for Kemper. That's for guitar and bass. They sound amazing. I sampled them myself. If you guys want to check out videos, we have plenty of content on YouTube, uh, you know, showing him coming up with these tones. And then we have a video where we showcase the tones raw from the guitar live. So uh, if you guys are interested, definitely go and check that out. Uh, kind of leading me into this like next conversation I've been dying to have with you, because anytime I can talk to a producer, this is something I really want to talk about. Is that you know, like we're moving into this era where plugins are so important and um, being, but being able to record yourself is so important. I think like anytime somebody asks me and says somebody DMs me or something says, "Hey, what do you think I should do? Do you think I should like focus on this? How do I start a YouTube?" I said, "Look, dude, the first thing you should possibly do right now is learn how to record yourself. Right? Learn yes. how to use your drum programs. Learn how to use your bass programs if you don't have a bass. Learn how to record yourself. Start building up that." you know, arsenal of stuff you need to do, because I just don't think it's enough to be a good guitar player anymore. I think you need to be able to record yourself and kind of showcase that. I uh, just want to get your thoughts on, you know, kind of where we're heading. Okay. So where we're heading, like in terms of like music in terms production, of like the way people are home producing their own music and kind of the, the yeah. amount of things they can get away with now from home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So for me, so I will tell you this. So I use no hardware. I have an extremely simple setup. I use my laptop and I mix on these earbuds right here. <laughs> I am not lying in my, yeah. Like I'll check my mixes in the car and everything, but at my home studio here, I have no, at my real studio, I have a full setup, but at my home studio, I just have my laptop, no monitors, a pair of headphones um, and this pair of earbuds and like a Beats pill that I check my music on. So yeah, so I don't use I don't use any hardware basically. Like when I'm recording a record, I just use my UAD Apollo and a laptop, and everything is digital. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, this is something I think about all the time. What advice would I give to kids that are coming up that want to you know produce or have like kind of a career in music and um, as a producer, I think I do think that the number one most important thing is that you have to be musical. I think that learning an instrument or learning how to sing or just having a sense of musicality and being able to create a song by yourself is invaluable and is super important. And I wish that that's something that I wish that someone told me like years ago, like being able to play guitar or being able to play drums or being just being a musical person, having a sense of music and listening to music and being able to pull from different generations of music and you know take ideas from great music that you love is super important um and then the second most important thing to me is speed and efficiency so obviously you know hardware outboard gear outboard compressors and stuff that stuff sounds amazing and is incredible and i'll take that stuff any day of the week but it is way more important to me to be able to you know open up rather than have you know a stack of 20 amps and taking days to go through the amps and microphones and cabs and stuff it's way more important to me to be able to open up a session on my computer and just have you know a bunch of sounds that i can really quickly scroll through to get the inspiration flowing and that applies to that applies to kind of every area like if i'm working on a mix um, it's way more important to have everything kind of laid out for me and for me to be able to make my changes quickly than to have to patch in a bunch of outboard gear and, and do that whole thing. And yeah, just being able to be fast and have everything in front of me and at my fingertips is super, super important, I think. So combine that with being a musical person. And that's, um, I think that's kind of how the future looks for producing and mixing. Yeah, I agree. I think that I think it kind of evolved on its own. I mean, you could the market spoke for itself when you kind of see what's flooding like the market right now is, is plugins. You know what I mean? And just the whether mm -hmm. it be mixing plugins or guitar plugins or bass plugins, it, like, anything MIDI, you know, I mean, it's just so big right now. If you're on Instagram, if you're on social media, I mean, what are you seeing? You're seeing ads, you're seeing people using these things It's so big. And I think that's just kind of speaking to, you know, if you're if you're a musician right now, and you're getting started, you know, I highly suggest you just start learning how to use a recording program, get yourself an audio interface and just get started in that because yes. what's that's really where it's gonna be at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some killer, killer bedroom guitarists and bands that are just they got really good at their craft. They're get really good at crafting their music and nobody's hearing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. Totally. Totally. And the thing too is that anybody can do it. 
you can do it. It wow. is it is like so easy to do. Like when I started producing 10 years ago, computers and, and it being easy to produce records in your bedroom was kind of like starting to be a thing. And nowadays, like it is with the tools out there, it is like really easy to make great sounding stuff if you put a little bit of time in. So I think that it's very much is worth the the investment. Like I mix so much stuff. I mix so many records nowadays and you know, I'm, I'm mixing. I never know what I'm, what I can talk about on stuff like this. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to spill the beans for any, any, right, right. any projects that I'm working on, but you know, I'm, I'm mixing some, some really amazing records right now that I'm super excited about. And the bands are, are pretty big and they produce themselves. And I, I think that is, that is an amazing thing because that way they're not on any kind of time constraint. And if they're good enough at doing it, like they are going to care more about the way their guitar sounds than anyone else will. You know what I mean? Like if they do, like, like I think there's something to be said for that. Um, and I, I really think that's a cool thing when bands can produce themselves um, and anyone can, if you put the time in. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah. Granted, we have somebody like you who can probably, you know, you have an ear and an act. Don't be able to sit down yeah. and take a, go from a pop record to a pop punk record to a heavy metal record and be able to just all talk <laughs> or kill it. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. Depending, yeah, depending on the band. Well, it's like, so yeah, certain bands, if they, if the band is, you know, a real career band and has a real vision of what they want to do and they're, you know, really good at doing it, if they can make a half decent sounding thing at their house, then I have no problem like spending a lot of time and doing like a heavy handed job to really help realize it and make it sound amazing on my end. And I think that's kind of that that's kind of a futuristic thing as well as having bands record, re produce and record themselves and, and their production may be good, but it may not be, you know, the most top tier production, but then having kind of like a modern mixer be able to really go in and really dig into the sounds and, and make it sound amazing. Um, I think that's kind of like something that we're going to start seeing a lot more of as well. Yeah, agreed. But I think the days of having to, you know, fly everybody out to a studio, be right in front of your engineer in order to have something that you already have, let's say you're at home and you just have, you know, a decent preamp and you can kind of go mm -hmm. in and record everything. Let's say you just didn't, you know, mess the whole thing up and they weren't terrible DIs and you, yeah. you can send that to like you, you know, mm -hmm. and just be like, hey, can you, you do you want to work with us on this? You can turn that into a viable product that you can put out from that. And it's like that, you know, that gap doesn't need to be yeah. put anymore. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I think I, but I mean, personally, I still hold a fantasy because like, you know, 10 years ago when I was playing guitar, I was like, man, what would it be like if a recording, you know, engineer guy said, hey, man, I love your sound. Why don't you come in? We'll record you an album, you know, of being there in this, yeah. and all that analog gear. And, and having like the headphones on and recording your your EP, I still yeah. hold that kind of <laughs> dear because I never got to experience that. You know what I mean? Every the technology by the time I was starting to actually get into recording just went way too fast. And at that point, it just doesn't. You know, unless the guy is like down the street, it just doesn't make any sense to do it that way. But yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I hope that one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. It's you know it's different for everyone, but that you know it is an option to produce your own band and record yourself at home and do an amazing job of it. Um, uh, you know, of course I, you know, I produce full, I still produce full time pretty much and have been work with artists full time and we collaborate a lot of the time, but yeah, if kids want to produce their own band at home and have someone else mix it, that is totally a thing that can happen, which I think is really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think more towards, especially like the heavy metal stuff like that, you know, when most of those bands are really guitar heavy, type thing so mm -hmm. uh, you know if you have your guitarist and he's got an audio interface and he's recording his stuff you know it's th yeah. those bands there's so many of them too and they're just all just i can I, i've heard some really really killer stuff you know what I yeah mean? Especially since like this plugin movement has come out like since i've been involved with stl tones and i've been you know helping with the uh with all the packs and stuff that's been, that have been coming out like people tag me and they post all kinds of stuff that they're playing and dm me on instagram and i'm like i can't believe like this is just like a kid in his bedroom, he's playing guitar, he's put his drum to it, he's put the bass to it, and it sounds really sophisticated. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> really good. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I know. There's yeah, there's so many kids that hit me up sometimes and they're like, you know, I want you to like produce our stuff. And then they send me some of their demos, and I'm like, I I don't I don't know what else I could possibly do. Like it sounds pretty good to me. Like a past yeah. thing you put out that's already out because it sounds like yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. What is, what is uh, what's been your go-to band to listen to in the past three months? You know, during this quarantine time, I think everybody's kind of probably listening to music more than ever. So, um, Rage Against the Machine has my favorite band. Like, I, I, you know, I, I have a couple of bands that I love. Slipknot's been like my favorite band ever. Um, through growing up, you know, they've, you know, I love metal, and they've, they're kind of like the kings of modern metal, and. Have, I just love I love like industrial music and that kind of music, so I just love the way that they've blended the worlds. But um, Rage Against the Machine has, especially through you know all the movements and everything that have been going on, but just in general, like that band is just so amazing, and and they're a band that I never really get tired of listening to. Um, they have like it's crazy. They have like the least amount of lyrics of like any band that I've ever heard. <laughs> but it's, but like but like they're just. It's so like their message is so good and just the way that they blended hip hop with this super unique style of guitar playing that was never done before and that honestly hasn't been replicated before. Um, I just think is so cool. Yeah, yeah there, I love some really cool like YouTube documentaries on just kind of breaking down how they sort of came out and the way it happened. It's just like such proof that things just happen organically. Like they didn't plan on it. They just went and started playing the songs. You can yeah. tell how they have such a simplistic and, and basic approach to the song, yeah. yet they mm -hmm. exploded and they're, and it's timeless, right? You can just blast that right now. And nobody's going to be like, Oh, what do you listen to old man? They're just, you know, whether it's a <laughs> pop fan or whether it's like a heavy metal fan, right? You yeah. Can super into Pantera and just start headbanging into Reg Against, like, yeah, Reg Against the Machine, you know, it's like, yeah. it's so insane how that went directly across the board. Totally. And yeah, it still sounds amazing. And like, no one has done what they do as good as they do it, in my opinion. Um, yeah, it's been amazing. And that that's something that I'm also, you know, a firm believer on is is honesty in music is one of the most important things to me. Like whenever I'm working with an artist, my biggest thing, I just want to I just want to create a comfortable space for people to be able to talk about things that they may not be comfortable talking about in front of other people. And I just want people to just feel comfortable and be in their most honest form with me. Like, I don't want anyone to feel like they're being judged or like they have to impress me or something. It's, I just want, I just want to hang out and I just want you to be honest with me. And, um, and I want, yeah, I want you to feel comfortable because that's what leads to, you know, organic, honest music is the, is what connects with the most people, I think throughout history that's, that's been proven. Cool. What, uh, what do you think was your main influence when you were kind of growing up, getting into music? When did that happen and what were you listening to? Yeah, I, it was in, yeah, it was in fourth grade. I, my dad bought an acoustic guitar and he kind of started playing the guitar and I just picked it up one day and, and just fell in love with it and just kind of never put it down. And it's really funny. My, yeah, my, my, I always, when I was growing up, my parents would always play a lot of like Elton John and Billy Joel. And like, I love that stuff. But one day it's the same story as so many kids. I just discovered Metallica and it blew my mind and i was and, it, and it's you know it's it's actually is kind of funny because the first the first metallica song i ever heard was saint anger <laughs> and i, <laughs> and I yeah, and I, I, and, and I'd, I'd never heard any but i'd never heard anything like that and i was like this is insane and then um and then i went and discovered you know the black album and everything like that and then i went and just and and i thought they were like the only band to ever sound like that. I thought they were like the only metal band like ever. Cause like back in the day, you know, there wasn't too much internet and stuff and it was kind of hard to, to find things. Um, but yeah, then eventually I went and found, you know, more metal bands and, um, and yeah, Metallica is kind of the band that opened the door for, for music that I love. Um, yeah. That, that's crazy that the first Metallica song you heard. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It's so, it, yeah, it's so weird, but, but it's also funny as well. Cause the, um, a few years later is kind of when Dr. Luke and that whole like dance pop, like Katy Perry thing was really big for a long time, like Kesha and all that stuff right. and, and one direction, even stuff like that. And like the production and songwriting on that stuff is just so like, incredible and i was obsessed with that stuff as well so i was kind of like i was listening to like metal and like top 40 pop and kind of like not really anything in between like for a long time um and yeah i think that's kind of is what's made me the way i am like i love super heavy aggressive music and then i love 
super sophisticated pop music as well, well I guess. I, I think that when you, get yeah. into, when you get into the realm of like producing and recording anything, so I mean, obviously I, I'm not an engineer or producer or anything, but I try to record my own music. And if anybody mm -hmm. who's tempted to do it, you don't even have to like pop at that point. Obviously I'm never gonna put like top 40 on on purpose. I'm, I'm a mm -hmm. metal guy, but when I'm driving down the street and like my family or whatever, or I, like it comes on the radio and I, I listen to it and I'm like, God, this is like amazing. Like I'm not even really necessarily, it's not about the singer or the song to me, but just the production value of that. I can hear like a, a swell come up and I'll hear a, like a really cool like vibe come in. And I'm like, dude, that's, that was a guy at a desk who said, you know what needs to be here? This needs to be here. And to me, that blows my mind <laughs> because I'm like, how did he think of that? You know, because like, oh, yes, that's so yeah, just yeah. Like top 40, you can seriously appreciate how good these guys are in the studio. Yeah, totally. And it, it is funny, too, because I was talk. I remember I was talking to someone about this one time and they were like, well, there is a lot of similarities between like metal and like a class pop. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, and both genres, like everything is super perfect and pristine and like calculated and like, you know, every little detail is kind of attended to and taken care of. And I was like, yeah, that's true. I never thought about that before. So, yeah, that's, I yeah. think metal and like, you know, hard rock sometimes they play off of mistakes, you know, mistakes is almost a good thing. It makes it feel raw. It makes it feel real. Yeah, um, you can. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that there's like videos you can point to, especially with like classic rock where there's a ton of mistakes and they left them in on purpose because they gave it so much character. Uh, yeah. The contrast from where we're at now with pop and things like that, where I think it's equally as good because it speaks to just how smart and just how capable these guys are in the studio. But it is about, you know, it being premeditated, really perfect. You go back and fix that if it's there or you know, everything's really well intended. So I think that's pretty Yeah, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, pretty crazy. What's uh, mm -hmm. what's, what's your go-to guitar? I know you can, I know you use a ton of different guitars in the studio, but if you're yes. going to play one, what's what's your favorite guitar to play? So, yeah, so my studio down the street, it's actually is owned by my managers, Benji and Joel Madden. Um, they're in the band Good Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, I produced their last album. Super, we've been friends for a long time. And so they bought this amazing studio years ago. And so a lot of the guitars that I use are like Benji's like prize guitars, which are like really amazing. So he has, I don't know what the model is, but it's a Sir guitar is called. And it has, it's kind of like a telly shape and it has P90s in it. And it just sounds insane. It just, it's super hot and it sounds really amazing, really unique tone. Um, he has a couple of old Gretches there that sound like super warm and, you know, super amazing. They have their own flavor. Um, I love those. He has a Gibson, one of those hummingbird acoustics. Mm -hmm. So that's like my go-to acoustic. Um, that one sounds amazing. And then um, we've actually, my friend Chris Griotti, who I work with a lot of the time, has this, he just got a brand new Fender Jazzmaster. And I didn't, I didn't expect to like it. And I have been loving this thing. Like, it's like, it's like, a, I think it's like a 2020 brand new jazz master. And like, it sounds amazing. Um, so yeah, those guitars are all awesome. Um, if I could only have one guitar though, it would, I would, no, I would, I would choose two guitars. If I could only have two guitars, it would be, <laughs> I would have a Les Paul because that's just my bread and butter. Like it doesn't you can kind of do anything with it. And then I would have a 335 as well. Um, nice. Because those are, yeah, those, um, yeah, we have a really amazing, like old 335 at the studio and that that one's awesome. I'm, yeah, on the all time low record I produced last year, that's the only guitar I used on the entire album for wow. cleans and leads and rhythms and everything is is really? pretty much all that guitar, yeah. So I, play, I played a couple. I, I, I would never own one because I wouldn't do it justice and I would, I would be a disrespect to that guitar. <laughs> Yeah, those are, I mean, some of those hiring guitars are amazing guitars. I, when I did, but I noticed that you like those warmer tone guitars. You like thicker body mm -hmm. guitars, what I could tell that natural, that natural tone. So yeah. um, like when I did your closer look on your pack, I, I borrowed a telly because mm -hmm. I, 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 unfortunately I just don't own those style of guitars. I don't know what's, I mean, I play blues yeah. every once in a while when I'm just kind of chilling, you know what I mean? But I, I don't mm -hmm. own any of those type of warm guitars, but mm -hmm. yeah, the guitars definitely sound amazing. I think that's the, I think that's next in line for me is I'm going to look for one of those. Yeah, the styles of guitars. Totally. Yeah, something else I, I like to do that's fun with guitars a lot is um I produce this girl named Poppy. I don't know if you ever heard of her, and it's it's kind of yeah, like I, like, okay. I accidentally saw like one of her um videos just like a couple of days ago. I don't even know why, but I was like on YouTube screwing around and I saw it. Yeah, it's it's kind of a, a crazy project, and it's it's like the most 
excuse me, it's like the most fun thing in the world ever to work on. It's like we go between so many different genres from like metal to industrial to deathcore to the Beach Boys to Jellyfish to stuff like that. And it's kind of like just experimentation is the name of the game in that project. So a lot of the times um, we will take like a like a 335 and be like, what if we put this thing in like drop a like what would that sound like because that is totally not made for that and then like right, let's yeah. record that or like yeah we'll take like you know a telly and like drop it down super low or we'll take like an eight string and try to do like a jazz part on it or something so trying to like take guitars that are so not made for a certain thing and like forcing them to do the thing that they're not made for. And a lot of the times it sounds terrible, <laughs> but sometimes sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, they, yeah, sometimes it can be cool. So yeah, I like doing that. So, um, you know, as far as like, obviously there's kind of the old school ways of rec always recording guitar. You have a microphone, you have a cabinet, you have your preamp and all that stuff. Uh, like ha how has your approach to recording guitar tone specifically changed over the years uh, from when you started to where you're at now, if you're going to actually from the very beginning you know, with a band in studio, record a record and start with those guitar tones. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, back in the day, you know, it was all amps and all mic'd up amps and everything, which was amazing, which I love. These days I have, I basically, I bought a Kemper in 2014 or 2015 and made a ton of tones that I could use on that. And I've pretty much exclusively have used that for the last few years um, until STL put out Tone Hub, which also kind of does a similar thing. So my approach to Tone has kind of been, I will scroll through the bank of sounds that I have created and I will kind of tweak those um, to the band. And the other cool thing I love to do is with both plugins and Kempers, I love using guitar pedals with them. So. I'll have someone bring in their pedal board or, we, or we'll use my pedals. And I love be, I love like stacking up pedals before it hits the digital signal. I think that's like a really cool, unique sound. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my chain right now is like the pedal board either into the computer or into the Kemper and just make some crazy sounds. And then after we get the tones, I usually process them pretty heavily in Pro Tools as well with a bunch of plugins. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's my that's my next question is I know yeah. that like, you know, for the most part, you seem to be a very writing that modern wave of, you know, the methods of recording. And so it seems like you started mm -hmm. that way. You know what I mean? I think you're yeah. kind of into that. Uh, do mm -hmm. you ever run into studios or kind of run into situations where you have purists that are just kind of still, no, it has to be done this way. It has to be done that way. Um, you know, maybe kind of scoffing at the newer ways of recording stuff. Yeah, I do. I work with you know, I work with a lot of newer bands and I work with a lot of bands that have been around for a long time that have had a lot of success doing things a very specific way. And they're, you know, the, the only thing, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I was working with this one band the other day and they were like, they're like, the drum sound is like too punchy or something. Like, like put on like, like a record we did from like a while back. And then I put on, the, and, the, and they're like, just AP it, just listen to it. And then we put on their old record and they're like, actually what we're doing right now sounds way better. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a purist. I think whatever kind of creative process gets you to the goal that you want to get to and inspires you is, is cool. Um, if you're going to work with me, it's going to be a lot more digital and a lot more, um, kind of like modern new way of doing things. And I embrace that. I think that's really cool. Um, I work with this um, incredible artist named Grimes, um, who's amazing. And I remember, you know, so many people that, I, that I've worked with over the years, you know, analog is such a good thing and that analog warmth and that whole thing. And, and I was working with her and she, she was like, I just want to embrace the digital. I just want to fully and go the complete opposite direction and just embrace the box. And I was like, that's really cool. Like, I haven't really heard that before. Um, and another thing that I do a lot of the time recently is I record a lot of guitars through my phone. So pretty much I all of that. I saw yeah. you guys doing that with five seconds of summer. You guys did like a, an acoustic guitar yeah. through the phone. How, did, how mm -hmm. does that work? How do you do that? So, yeah. So a lot of the times, 
So pretty much all the acoustic guitar I will do through my iPhone and basically we'll get the part and then we'll get the tempo and then I'll just have the guitar player or myself sit with headphones and listen to the click track and just take their phone and um, put it on their lap and just record the acoustic guitar through their phone and then they will send it to me and I'll put it into Pro Tools and line it up and then put some effects on it. And it again, it just creates like a like a different sound. It's not better or worse than traditionally recording an acoustic guitar. It's just it's just a different new flavor that I think is cool. That's crazy. Now, are you using that type of sound to like as the main guitar track or is that something that you just kind of lay underneath to create a vibe when you need it or how's that work? Yeah, I have literally entire songs that I've done, some of which are out and some of which are not that are all of the guitars are through my phone. And sometimes it'll be like I'll play the guitar, we'll play the guitar through the Kemper or through the through the tone hub or whatever and I will and once the part is played I'll literally put my phone on the desk and play the guitar part out the monitors into my phone and put it back into the computer and we just we did you know we just try things and experiment and see what sounds cool and sometimes that sounds cool um that's yeah awesome. <laughs> like that's awesome don't get me wrong it's like so mind-blowing to hear but that's crazy <laughs> a lot of the times for bass as well i will we will record an acoustic guitar through a phone put it into the computer and pitch it down an octave and it sounds like an upright bass it's like it's really weird and cool and then i'll like layer that with like an 808 or something and you know again just trying to like find different ways to do things that's that's crazy. That's <laughs> here. I want to try it now. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna the I'm gonna be like just playing guitar to my phone and be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it sounds cool. <laughs> um, uh, next question: When you're gonna release like a big record, right? Let's say it's a big pop record or something like that. Not to say that that's more important than anything else you do, but when you're gonna release something like that, do you get nervous before you actually release it? Like, are you afraid? Are you kind of? not afraid, but are you like really thinking about the response you're going to get to that record? How is it going to be successful? Is that artist going to be happy with the response? Um, look, as long as like the artist and myself are super proud of what we did and love what we did, my, my, you know, the end, at the end of the day, like, of course I want to be happy, but, but my job is to make the artist like super happy. And if the artist can listen to their own music and love it, that's really is all that matters to me. And you know, yeah, like, no, like <laughs> chart positions and and how how it's received by the world and everything is really not important to me at all. It's kind of just I like as long as it's as long as it's as the artist loves it. And you know, there's been times in my career where we've we've done songs for other re reasons other than the artist loving it, and they have come out and it hasn't gone so well. And so like over the years, I've just have kind of learned that like, as long as like the artist loves what they do and they're just putting out honest stuff that they love, then it probably will connect anyway. Right. So yeah. So as, as long as I, as I know that we did that and that we did our job right, then there's no reason for me to be nervous because I know it's going to work. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, is there any like uh, one guitarist that you're into as a solo guitarist? You know, like right now, what's really big, especially on social media, is guitar players, like just singular guitar players. Obviously, that made its way like in the '80s and early, mm -hmm. and it kind of went more into the band section for a while. And we had our guitar heroes, but I think it's coming back right now, where we have um, people like Tosin and Abasi, and you have people like uh, Steven Toronto, who's insane. I don't know if you've seen him on Instagram, but some of the stuff they do, yeah. like, right? Yeah. Is there anybody totally. else creating just solo type? you know, guitar playing music that you're really into. Yes. Well, my of all time, my favorite guitar players are Dimebag and Tom Morello, but in a more, the more modern people, um, that guy, Mateus, you know yeah. him? Yeah. He, he, yeah, he is, uh, yeah, he's like, is unreal. So yeah, he's like, he, yeah, he's some, he's like my number one. If I'm going to like, if I want to watch Instagram guitar videos or something like I'll go to his page. He just has that. He's just so good at create at, his feel and just doing what's right and not being too flashy or too crazy or anything. And I don't know, he's like, he just creates guitars where like, I could just go to his page and click on one of his videos and just like, listen to it and enjoy it. <laughs> I guess. Right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That, that was my question too. Cause I mean, obviously I think we all have like, when we're not going to be listening to music, let's say we're just messing around on our phone, which most of us are most of the time anyway. Now yeah. if I'm on Instagram, I'm like looking through these guitar pages, just watching people, 
play guitar because it's so nuts now how we have you know back when all these other guys were coming out on youtube the ocean wasn't really that big of guitar players that were able to kind of translate their music online and show off what they were doing because you you had people who were really good but that doesn't mean they necessarily knew how to record themselves properly how to make good videos and now it seems like that's the standard right mm -hmm. I feel like having a youtube channel is almost turning into like having a Facebook account. Like it's just something everybody has, you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, yeah check out my stuff here. It's on here. Like, just go check it out on, on YouTube. And so like, I remember thinking I was really good right before I really got into the ocean of YouTube and Instagram and things started coming out. And then it's just like 14 year olds just mopping the floor with me. Like, <laughs> on guitar, and I was just like, oh my God. So I think it's like leveling up the bar to how good these guys are. You know what I mean? Like, the competition level is just nuts. Not to say yes. that guitar playing is a competition, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that obviously, when you see somebody do so well, you aspire to be that good, if not better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a really cool thing for sure. And I, yeah, I guess something that's important in that, on that note, is how do you stand out from the competition? It's, maybe sometimes it's not about being faster or better or worse. It's about being different. And, you know, how do you, how do you create your own unique flavor that when that people are like, I know that that's him playing the guitar, you know, that, that's so. really what's difficult now at this point. Um, like I said, everybody has a YouTube channel. Everybody has mm -hmm. a page and it's how, how are you different? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, you can be really, really good right now. And yeah. unfortunately, there's just, a lot of people that are already really, really, not to say you're not just as good, but it's already there. So how do mm -hmm. you go out of that whole crowd? I think that's the million dollar question when you're doing anything, whether if you're starting a business, whether if you're playing guitar, whether if you're singing, it's like standing mm -hmm. out is so difficult these days, but yeah, that's yeah. The game, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know, <laughs> I guess just well, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nuts like covering yeah. yourself in peanut butter and like putting a pink hat on and then playing yeah. a guitar solo like how do you even get noticed do you have to do this over the top crazy stuff yeah uh, do it. it's just so difficult now i just don't see anybody kind of just playing something and being really good at it doing anything now it's like shock value all over again you know it has to shock people it has to yes sort of out somehow yeah yeah absolutely yeah shout out to my friend and and someone that i collaborate with a lot his name is chris griotti and he's like you know, grew up on like Van Halen, super shredder, insane guitar player. And he's been doing these crazy videos on Instagram where he will cover like a like a Lady Gaga song or a Dua Lipa song and right. just kind of dress up crazy and, and go crazy with it. And he has like a green screen behind him. So like behind him, he may be like, he would be playing on like the beach or on like the top of like a building or something while he's like shredding. And he's got like lasers coming out of his guitar. I don't know. It's like, it's crazy. But, but like, but yeah, that's that's something that I think is pretty cool. <laughs> that That is pretty cool. Yeah. And like crazy stuff like back in the day, which is like, uh, was kind of like that was shot. It was like Steve Stevens, you know, with his like he was making noises with a guitar with like a weird toy ray gun. I don't know if yeah. you saw those. I did a yeah. clinic with him, mm -hmm. and he had like you you can like see all the guns that he uses, the little toy ray guns. Yeah, he, now, I think he hasn't built into his guitar now, but um, yeah, he used to use that stuff to get crazy noises out of the guitar during solos. Yeah, absolutely. Know that when you hear some of the old recordings, some of the uh, the Billy Idol recordings, that that's him actually in studio using this like gun on his pickups and like in the oh wow like, it's like a weird noise that he's so crazy yeah it's just that it's just finding that thing that makes you like stand out yeah like tom morello it's you know the whammy pedal like made him it was so simple and it was like no one really did it before him and like he kind of did it so he took that spot and like you can't really do it after him either because like you're not going to do it better than him and like he did it but it's just finding that that unique thing that makes you stand out as a player um, is is what's cool. Yeah. What was the moment you think where you were sitting at a desk, maybe in a studio somewhere, and you were you know either tracking somebody or you were mixing something where you said, "Oh man," like for the sake of not using bad language, but that moment where you're like, "What am I doing here?" Like I'm I'm mixing this artist's <laughs> record right now. Like how did you when what moment like when did you have that moment? every single day every, <laughs> <laughs> everything that i do it's like you know it's kind of, it's just so funny like i i think a lot of people that do what i do feel that way where you look at this out like every time an album that i do comes out i am like 
I listen to it and I'm like, I have no idea how this happened. And then like, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's scary. Like when you get in the studio with an artist and you're expected to come out with a song at the end of the day that didn't exist at the beginning of the day. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's always scary. Um, but for me, usually I found that the first, the first few hours of each session, excuse me. So, so the way that I work is, I write a lot of the songs that I do with artists um, and we typically do like a song a day. So like the artists will come in in the morning with nothing. And then by the end of the day, we'll have a song. And typically it's like, if the artist comes in at noon or one, we kind of, you know, hang out and have a good time. And then we just kind of mess around with sounds until like five or 6 PM. And then everyone kind of gets a little on edge and they're like, I don't know what's going to happen. And then, but, I, and then we get dinner and then we come back from dinner. And then as long as we like keep going and finish the idea, then it, it literally like will come together. Like, like at like 11 PM, we'll do something in like 10 minutes. Then all of a sudden, like the entire song kind of comes together. So I just try to remember that, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's always scary. Like everything that I do and everything that I work on, you always, there's always this uncertainty because there's, there's not really like to, to the way that I work, there's not really like a method of like, okay, I have to do this, 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 and then I will have something. It's like to, to create a song, it's like, how do you sit down and like do that? There's there's a lot of things that you could do and there's a lot of things that could, you know, like the convenience of digital recording is something that helps me a ton to be able to do it easier. But it's like, how do you pull an idea out of thin air that is good? Um, so I, I've just found that as long as I kind of find something and commit to it and stick with it and just work on it for a few hours, um, by the end of the day, it winds up being good. And that's just something that I try to remember every single day you know every time i sit down to do a mix every time i sit down to produce a song it's it's always scary but then i just remember like you know what i've done this so many times before and i just need to work at it and get to the end right and then it usually works out <laughs> so have you have you been writing any music in the past three months have you been working on anything just you uh, what, what, what yeah can you expect coming soon um, I've been working with this artist named Youngblood for a really long time. Um, right. We've been working on his second, he's put out a bunch of singles, but we've been working on his second record for the better part of the last like year or two. Um, and yeah, we're still like in the studio, like as much as we can be in the studio and writing tons of songs. And yeah, we have like a ton of super amazing material that I'm super excited about so that's been in terms of like producing and writing that's been one of the main things that i've been working on for a long time um, i'm super excited about it um and yeah i've been i i've been writing a bunch of a bunch with a lot of artists but i'm kind of scared to say <laughs> too much about it as well um but yeah yeah but yeah my my yeah my boy young blood that's that's the thing that i'm i'm extremely extremely excited for his for his next record to come out awesome awesome yeah sounds good all right man well thank you for joining us i'm gonna let you go um just for anybody watching again zach has a you know camper packs and uh tone hub packs for guitar and bass if you guys are interested go head over to stltones.com to check those out but uh as i stated previously the stl tones uh podcast is back so tune in for the next coming episode zach thank you so much for joining us man i appreciate it thanks for having me been a pleasure Thank you.